Okay, so in the last um, episode, we talked about trying to shift the focus um, of how we understand humility slightly differently. Just to summarize, we asked for three shifts of focus that we needed um, in order to get a better understanding of humility as a moving, changing, dynamic, everyday thing. And these three shifts of focus were one, towards the emotional, towards understanding it first and foremost as a, an affective or emotional phenomenon. Uh, second, towards the relational, towards understanding humility as a relational event between persons or subjects, away from the inside and away from the self. And third, towards the ordinary, humility as present in everyday, transient and fleeting situations. Um, thinking about this brings up, brings us close to what I want to talk about in this episode, which is engagement. Understanding engagement is not easy. It's a vague term and we can define it in, a, in 10 different ways. We can pull definitions out of 10 different hats. It's not really going to um, help us pin it down. What we really need to understand engagement is its variety. How do we think about it? How do we see it? How do we experience it? And why does it matter? When does it matter in our everyday lives? Discussions have emerged in two particular domains, um, two particular domains which have been known not to be um, revealing of humility in, in, in its practitioners. And one is in medical in medical practice or in dialogues between doctors and patients, right? And the other is between official representatives of governments or social workers that's, or, or care workers in some kind of official capacity and their relations with people from other cultures, okay? In both of these areas, problems of challenges to humility have frequently come up. Now, so it's not surprising that in these two domains, discussions have emerged about how humility really is important. And people take different lines, argue different things. One of the things that people argue about is there's a new concept which has been, which has come up and goes some way towards understanding engagement, which is um, an idea called narrative humility. Now, narrative humility basically argues that when you're in an encounter with a person from another culture, it's always other cultures, right? It's never us. Um, when you're in such an encounter, what you're doing is not keeping your own judgment, but actually putting yourself out there in that conversation, not just listening to the other person create their story, but kind of co-creating their story with them without taking uh, without dominating them and without letting them out so that they just are asked to do it, to write their story, tell their story on their own. Some kind of a participation in that dialogue. And now this sounds to me, engage with them and then you get a good story. That's what it sounds like. Both of these things in both of these domains, medical practice and in talking to other cultures, involve something in us about the way we see in that moment, the way we see the other as a person. And both involve a participatoriness and openness to engagement and a kind of a co-authorship of what follows. Okay, so there's something about engagement we need to understand. What is it? How do we think about it? Well, Thinking about this, we've kind of tried to come up with some criteria for engagement. Um, I'll list them for what they were. They definitely overlap with each other. They definitely um, perhaps tap into something more core and more central, but seeing them as slightly separate facets um, might help us understand what we mean by engagement and why it matters in understanding humility. Okay, the first and probably the most important is seeing the other as a person. Second, being involved, getting in there, putting yourself on the line. Third, not focusing on the self. Fourth, leaving a door to dialogue open so you can hear the other. Uh, that was that. That was four. So now five, appreciating value in the other. And six, being attracted to difference. Okay. All of these features require some kind of an openness to connection, and it is really not necessarily conscious. So let's take that first criterion, seeing the other as a person. Um, it could be seen as being linked to many, many discussions in the philosophical and indeed political science literature about recognition, as a consciousness, people have talked about it for years and years. Hegel talked about it as you only, I think you see, he says you only are 
a self-consciousness because you have been recognized as a self-consciousness. I've got the words wrong, but it's something to that effect. Um, William James talked about being noticed, okay, as being absolutely crucial and not being noticed as being, he called it the worst form of torture because you simply cease to exist for uh, for somebody else. And Charles Taylor talked about it as a vital human need, and he talked about it in, in the context of understanding race and colonialism and whole, whole groups of people having an inability to be and to relate to themselves successfully because they are not recognised by others. Okay, So seeing the other as a person seems to be involved in making the other exist as a person. The aspect I want to focus upon um, really in relation to this is in everyday and in relating to another person, Martin Buber distinguished something that he called an I-thou form of relating from an I-it form of relating. So for him, an I-thou form of relating involves me being utterly present in this moment of relating to you. So I see you as a thou right? I see you as a person and I'm, I'm talking to. And I am not thinking of you as, oh, that's the audience hidden behind the camera, or, or that's the camera person signaling to me not to make too many gestures. I'm seeing you without the filter of all these things, without the filter, without categorizing you as something, making you a subject rather than an object. Um, I don't see you through another agenda. I've got to entertain the audience. I just am there with you in the moment and I see you as a thou. I don't exclude your subjectivity and I adopt what has come to be called a second person stance towards you. So if I see you as a thou, as a you basically, rather than a he or she is sitting there behind the camera, uh, I am talking to you in the second person, right? Not in the third person, not referring to you as a person out there, but actually directly addressing you. And this, in so many different ways, I'm going to, I'm biased towards understanding human development and babies, but in so many different ways, it makes a phenomenal difference being addressed as a you. It draws things out of you, it allows things to happen, and so on. Think about examples where not seeing the other as a person can be, is very common, but also can be quite damaging. Student passes you on the stairs, you're so busy thinking of um, the meeting that you've got to get to, all you see on the stairs is student after student passing, you don't see the person. After you pass, you suddenly realize, damn, they were looking at me and kind of saying hello and kind of expecting me to respond to them. You haven't seen it. And it's okay. It's a momentary damage. It doesn't, probably they're not going to go home and cry about it, but it could be damaging. Um, okay. You have elections coming up and you open the door to a knock and you see a member of another political party. Um, what do you see? You really don't see the person standing there. You see the blue of the label. You see a person representing a category of persons. You do not see the person. Now, you're not going to open your heart out to this person. You're going to talk to them very much through this filter of this label and this category. Um, HAP happens very often in medical communications. I mean, there are examples galore where people talk about doctors rushing in saying, I don't have time to explain now, let me just get on with this. Now, obviously, in, in cases of emergency, you really want that to happen. But in other cases, people are pushed aside and feel small. They feel demeaned. They feel um, belittled by that kind of deprioritization because they don't exist as a person. They exist as a patient. Um, there's another example um, which I'm kind of intrigued by and I've talked about it at other times. It's in Anna Karenina, in Tolstoy's Anna Karenina. And um, so there's this man, this kind of rather boring, uh, disciplined man called Karenin, who's married to this beautiful, much younger, vivacious Anna. Um, and his wife is young. She's popular, she's lovely, she's a good, dutiful wife. But one evening at a party, she spends rather a long time talking to this handsome young soldier, and he feels a bit uncomfortable. He goes off home, this Mr. Karenin, and prepares himself for telling her when she comes home not to spend so much time talking to handsome young men. Now, as he's you know, because he doesn't really doubt her, he trusts her, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But as he's preparing himself, he has um, a momentary glimpse of perhaps he's wrong. Perhaps there is something in her that he hadn't actually um, 
recognized before. And I'll just read you those, the words. For the first time, he vividly conjured up her personal life, her thoughts, her wishes, and the idea that she might, even must, have a personal life all her own was so frightening that he hastened to drive it away. This was the chasm into which he dared not look. Okay, he was a bit of an extreme, dried up kind of person. But he wasn't unusually arrogant. He wanted to connect with her. She comes home, okay? And here is where this kind of fleeting swapping of roles happens. She comes home full of the of being enli enlivened by this encounter with this young man whom later on she has an affair with and so on, but that's not yet on the cards, that's not yet happened. She comes home, he gently broaches this uh, topic with her and she puts up a wall, um, said, what's the problem? Well, you know, there isn't anything wrong, etc., etc. And he, despite his closing off of her consciousness to himself, to his consciousness, despite that, in that moment, in that moment of her putting up this denial of his concerns immediately recognize there's something going on, right? She, normally a very humble, easygoing, non-arrogant person, in that moment of casting him off as, oh, he's just cold and unfeeling, is absolutely being arrogant. He, she's categorizing him into this category of pain, uh, a painful husband. <laughs> and we're probably familiar in our own lives with uh, many examples when we've had Argument after argument within relationships, a sibling, a parent, a husband, a, a partner, and so on and so forth, where out of sheer exhaustion, we shut the doors. We stop seeing them as persons. And it's kind of like that's the only thing we can do because we're only human and we have limited sources of uh, energy to deal with the emotions we have. The point about here is, yes, it is about seeing the other as a person, but it is very, very much rooted in how you feel at the moment and long term.